Well, good morning, children. Good morning, children. They're about as talkative as, talkative as you guys are. It's wonderful to see you all. Who likes birthdays? Birthdays are great fun, aren't they? Yeah, birthdays are fun. What's a really great part about birthdays? Veggies. No. Oh, sorry. What were you going to say? Great answer. Spending time with our friends and family. That's right. What else is a great part of birthdays? Yep. The cake. Yes. Cake. Yep. Okay, let, let me help you. You get something. Okay, it's about this big. It's got a little bow on the top. And you, what do you do? What is it? A present. That's right. Presents are great. Come on. Presents, are, aren't they like the best part? No, you've got the right answer. But presents are great. You get to open up the present and see what's inside. Now, let me ask you a really hard question. Do people give you presents because you deserve them? No. Why do they give you presents? Yes, because they love you. And they look at you and they say, it's your birthday and I love you, so I bought you a present. And you go, wow, and you open it up and you don't think to yourself, well, you know, the reason they gave me a present is because I'm so amazing. I'm so smart. I'm so clever. I'm so good looking. Well, you might think this, but I don't think this. I never think that, and neither do you. Do you just, you know people do that because they care for you and they love you. Well, today, we're beginning looking at the story of Christmas. And over the next six sermons, all the way through to Christmas, we're going to be looking at the book of Luke. And in the Luke, in Luke, one of the big things we see is that Jesus came down not because we deserved it, not because we deserved it, but because God loves us. And we've got a special word for that. It's called grace. Grace means we get what we don't deserve. God gives us a gift because he loves us, just like the present at our birthday. So let's thank God for that. Dear God, we thank you that just like on our birthdays, but Infinitely more, you have given us Jesus Christ, not because we deserve it, but just because you love us. Lord, as we open up your word later on, and even now, would you apply this truth to our hearts? We pray for these children that are here this morning. We thank you for their presence amongst us. Thank you that you are building up another generation of people who love you. And we pray, Lord, that you would gather them to yourself. Jesus, as you did upon this earth, you would take them upon your knee and bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I said to the children, we're beginning a small little mini-series as we travel through to Christmas. Jeff will be preaching for us in the series tonight. We're going to be opening up the Gospel of Luke together and just having a look at six sermons as we think about the Christmas story. So it's two this week, two next week, and then Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 26 through to 38. And this evening, Jeff will be looking at verse 39 through to 56. Just actually on this evening, I did forget to say that this evening, Nay will be coming. This is her last Sunday before she returns back to Cambodia. So I do encourage you, come and join us. She's just going to very quickly, she's not doing a massive report, she's just going to say bye. Um, and take the chance to say bye to us tonight. But I do encourage you to come and pass on your love to her in person and encourage her heart as she returns with Micah back to Cambodia again. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to be starting at verse 26. This is God's word for you this morning. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, 
Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern the sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So far the reading of God's word. Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. This morning, we thank you that it is so rich and pure and true. Thank you, Lord, that it is food for our soul. Lord, we come here because we love you. We come here because because you've redeemed us. And we come here because, because we want to hear from you. Lord, we pray that as as we open up your word this morning, as we gaze upon this proclamation of grace, that, Lord, you'd help us to see wondrous things. Help us to see your beauty, that we might behold you in your glory this morning in the preaching of your word. Lord, would you strengthen me as my throat is feeling very worn out right now. I pray, Lord, that you would watch over all of us that your Holy Spirit may open up the word. Lord, our our mental capacities mean nothing in the end of the day, for we are blind unless you give us eyes to see. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder if if you were to to go onto the street and do a survey of 100 people, and you were to ask them what they deserve, what would they say? What do you think? You know, if, if you were to just ask random people, not, not people just sitting here, but just any random person anywhere you looked and you'd ask them, what, what, you know, what do you deserve in life? I wonder what sort of responses you'd get. You know, I deserve a happy life. I deserve a family. I deserve people that love me. I deserve a roof over my head. I deserve, et cetera, et cetera. There'd be probably a long list of all the different things that we deserve. And it's because as humans, and this, you know, we talk about the entitled generation, but as humans, we have an entitlement issue. Sorry, that includes all of you, regardless of what generation you're a part of. I know it's fun to look down on the millennials, but unfortunately, this applies to all of us. We have an entitlement problem. And what I mean by an entitlement problem is that since the very beginning of Adam and Eve, we have thought that we deserve more than what we've got. Isn't that what Adam and Eve did? I deserve to be like God. So I'm eating the tree. I'm eating, well, I'm not eating the tree, I'm eating the fruit. I'm eating the fruit because I deserve it. Satan's right. I deserve it. And so they took it and ate. You think about Cain. I deserve to receive what Abel got. And so he kills his brother. Think about David. Looks out the window. I deserve Bathsheba. And so he takes her. And if you, don't think, if you don't think that you have a problem with this, just consider for yourself for a second, when something bad, really bad happens in your life, what do you say to yourself? 
I don't deserve this. But do you notice that when something really good happens, you never say, I don't deserve this. You say, well, this is, oh, this, this is about fear. I think this is a good thing to happen to me. You know, when the good happens, we think we deserve it. Yes, right on. When the bad things happen, we say, no, no, wait a second. Somebody else deserves that. We have an entitlement problem. And I think this bleeds into all sorts of areas of life. And it bleeds into Christmas. So when we think about Christmas and we think about the coming of Jesus, we can be tempted to think to ourselves, well, we deserved it. Humans deserve Jesus Christ to come down. It's, it's, it's why people love the Christmas story. Even non-Christians love the Christmas story, don't they? Have you, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard someone complain about the Christmas story. I've heard lots of complaints about Easter, lots of complaints about Bibles in school, but if you tell the wonderful story of a God being born to do wonderful things in your life, no one seems to mind. Because we deserve it. We deserve God to do great things for us. And I wonder if we were to ask the people on the side of the road whether Mary deserved what happened to her, what they would say. You know, oh, of all people, Mary deserved to have Jesus. I mean, look at this, this poor young thing. She's so fitting. She's so worthy. She's so honorable. She, of all people, is right to be selected to be the bearer of Jesus Christ. And yet, what we see when we come to the story of the birth of Jesus Christ is that the opposite is the true truth. The story of Christmas and the story of salvation is that none of us are worthy. No one is worthy. Everything from start to finish is grace. By grace, what is grace? Undeserving merit, undeserving favor. You deserve nothing and you get everything. That's what grace is. It's God deciding to do good things for you and to you for no other reason than because he wants to. That's the story of Christmas. God sends his son because he decides to and because he loves us when we deserve nothing, no love, no goodness. And as, as this angel appears to Mary, we see grace played out all the way through. And so it begins with this beautiful, gracious greeting, doesn't it? In the sixth month, Gabriel turns up in the beginning of verse 26, comes to a virgin who's betrothed. If you're not sure what betrothed means, it means they're not married yet, they're engaged. But in these days, being engaged meant being married. You just didn't live together yet. So you had to get a divorce to break it off. It was like a pre-marriage marriage. It was set in stone. So they're basically married, but they're not living together. Of course, the point Luke's making is that she's a virgin. They're betrothed. They're not married yet. She's a virgin, and it's to Joseph's wife, who's from the line of David. And this woman's name is Mary. And this angel comes to to Mary and gives a very interesting, gracious greeting. The angel turns up in the house, funnily enough. He doesn't knock on the door. He just manifestedly appears. It's probably an interesting way to spoil your day, isn't it, ladies? You're busy organizing the house and doing your work, and all of a sudden, an angel turns up, and you're like, I'm not ready for visitors. Too bad, Mary. There's an angel here. And the angel says, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. You know, how you greet a person really matters. I wonder if you've ever been told this. I used, to, I used to work in door-to-door sales. I used to sell vacuum cleaners door-to-door, in case you didn't know. I was one of those annoying people. And I used to train people to become those annoying people. That's right. That was my job. And so one of the things I used to always say to my staff was, the first 
15 seconds of any interaction with a person will impact what happens about an hour later. The first 15 seconds of how you interact with a person when they open their door will judge whether you get in a house and whether you sell them something. The, the greeting is that important. And so the biggest thing I would drum home with them every single time was this is how you welcome them. This is what you say. This is how you repeat the name. This is how you make them feel treasured and honored. This is how you make them feel special. But I tell you, I never, ever, ever knocked on a door and said, greetings, O oh favored one. <laughs> Never in my life did I ever say that, and maybe it would have worked, but I never said that. What a bizarre greeting, isn't it? And yet, this is a saying which has had a lot of fuss made over it. In order to understand the incredible truth of what is being said here, Firstly, consider who it's been said to. You know, three other people that have been called favored in the Bible. Noah, Moses, and Daniel. Think about who Mary's being likened to. Jesus turns up to Noah and, and it says that he's, he's favored by God. He he. he He's favored by the Lord. And, and Moses, Moses, Moses makes a request of God, and God says, you've found favor in my eyes, and I'm going to grant it to you. And, and Daniel, by the angel, is called the one whom God favors. It's a, bit, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty stellar lineup, isn't it, to be likened to as a simple, simple little woman in her house probably known by almost no one. And yet the angel says that, that she's favored. And, and then the angel says that the Lord is with her. And I wonder if that rings a bell with you. Do you, do you remember, remember Gideon? All the teenagers who were at camp should remember this. But Gideon, remember what the angel says? Turns up and says, Oh, mighty, mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. And so here Mary is being likened to a warrior of the Old Testament and a prophet of the Old Testament. And, and to, to understand the profundity of this, sometimes it's helpful to think about how it's been understood wrongly. So, so the, the Catholic Church ha, has understood this to mean that, that Mary in and of herself has made herself favorable to God and worthy of God's grace and therefore has grace to give to others. That's why you pray to Mary, because she has grace to give to you. That, that's not what it means. In fact, that's the opposite of what Luke is stressing. It, it's pretty hard to sort of translate it in English because it's actually just one word. O oh, favored one is just one word in Greek. It's just one really long one. And... You could, you could almost translate it like, Oh, you who have been favored by God. You hear the, the difference between that? Oh, you who have been favored by God. In other words, oh, you who God has decided to set his favor upon. Not, not oh, you who has earned favor with God. But the point Luke is making is that Mary's done nothing. She's just, she's just betrothed, and she's just doing what every girl does in that generation. And the angel turns up and says, the Lord's chosen you. The Lord's with you. The Lord has set his favor upon you. And the reason we know that that's exactly what is meant is because of how Mary responds. How does Mary respond? She doesn't go, yeah. That's right. I'm great. I clearly deserve this. She does the exact same thing that Gideon does. Do you remember Gideon? What's Gideon do? Oh, mighty man of valor. And Gideon goes, who's the angel talking to? And Mary does the same thing. Look, verse 30. Sorry, verse 29. But she was greatly troubled 
not at the angel. Everyone else sees the angel and is terrified. Mary is troubled with something far different. She's troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. What on earth do you mean I am favored by God? It's been 400 years since we've had a prophet. It's been 400 years since we've had a spokesperson of God, and you turn up to me, a nobody, in the middle of nowhere, and you say I'm favored by God. That doesn't make sense. Because who's favored in the eyes of the world? The rich, the famous, the important, the powerful, the successful, but not little old Mary. You see, what, what's going on for Mary right now is she's experiencing the incredible grace of being confronted by God. She's being confronted by the grace of God. And, and, and if, if Robert Murray McShane had, had lived yet, I'm sure Mary could have taken the words of his hymn on his lips, on her lips, and said, we are debtors to what? Mercy alone. We are debtors to mercy alone. You see, Mary recognized as soon as the words came out of this angel's mouth that there's something going on here. And it's not because of me. It's not because of me. Because I don't deserve this. And yet before, before Mary has a chance to try and work this out, the angel declares a, a gracious gift to Mary and to all of mankind. Verse 31 and the angel offers comfort in verse 30. Don't be afraid. Verse 31, And behold, you will receive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. I wonder if, um, ladies, you can remember that moment when you first found out you were pregnant with your first child. Remember that excitement, the wonder, the, the celebration with your husband as you rejoice together over this conception and, and just the, the, the hopes and the dreams of everything it's going to be and the longings of heart. And can you imagine what Mary must have been really confused about? Was it's one thing for someone to say, congratulations, you're pregnant. It's another thing for someone to say, congratulations, you're pregnant, and you're going to give birth to the greatest king. Just, just consider for a second the, the, the things that this angel says about this son to be born. This is no ordinary son, is it? This is no ordinary son. And look, it's really easy for you and I it's really easy for you and I to read these things and just go, yeah, I know it. Because I'm, I think I'm 34. I keep forgetting if I'm 34 or 35. But however old I am, I've spent that many Christmases hearing this story. Hearing this story over and over and over again and going, yeah, yeah, it's Jesus. I know. I get it at this point. I've heard a lot of Christmas sermons. Some of you have heard twice as many as me. And... You know, don't you? This, it, it sort of starts to lose its wow factor. It sounds bad, but you know that inside that womb is Jesus. But just consider for a second the depths of the reality of what this angel says. Just five things. Firstly, that she's going to give birth to a Savior. You might say, I don't see the word Savior. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why Jesus? Because it means he saves. He will save. It means he's a savior. It's what the very name of Jesus means. And even though it was a commonplace name up until the second century, 
it doesn't change the fact that the very name he is given points to the reality of what this child will fulfill. But not only is he a savior, Mary's told that he is a great son and a son or the son of the Most High. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the Most High. Now, can you just think about the contrast for a second here? Every time, to my knowledge, I'm fairly confident every time in the Old Testament when it talks about the Most High God, it's talking about someone way up there, way up there, way exalted up there, high and lifted up. You think about the the visions in the Old Testament. I, I, I lifted up my eyes and I looked into heaven and seated upon the throne was one who was highly exalted. And the angel says, He's going to be called that one's son. Think about the, can you see the contrast there that this angel is declaring? Something unthinkable that that one up there would be here as the son, the son of the most high God. It's an immense contrast. But, but not only is he the son of the most high God, he's going to be the son of David. And and, and now for you and I, we just go, okay, cool, he's David's son. For the Jew, this meant everything. Because the Jew had been promised and it had been prophesied that the son of David would come one day and redeem them from their enemies. And so Mary, who's brought up to know the scriptures, is probably ticking in her brain and thinking, son of David, son of David, son of David, where do I know that from? Wait a second. We were promised the son of David. But not not only is he the son of David, he's going to be the ruler of the entire people of Jacob. Have a look. Verse 33. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Who is Jacob? Jacob's Israel. So it's not just Judah. See, David is the king of Judah but he's going to be the king of Israel, the entire thing. So this, is, this is bigger than just the southern kingdoms, bigger than just Judah. This is the entire kingdom of Israel. <coughs> and, and, and Mary, her, her mind, I don't think her mind would have been able to comprehend the reality of all this. I do not think she would have been able to connect the dots on the mystery of this. And, and he's, going to, he's going to rule forever. Let's see, kings rule, they, they rule maybe 60 years, 40 years. Some queens go on ruling for a very long time. But eventually, they go like all the people of the earth, don't they? Not this one. His kingdom will have no end. His rule will last forever. He will set up a perpetual kingdom. Now, you've got to comprehend for a second that that they lived in a time when, I mean, we still do, but not so extreme as then. They lived in a time when kingdoms actually disappeared all the time. I mean, the Romans just snuffed out kingdoms. They went in, conquered kingdoms, and just snuffed them out. No one will conquer this kingdom. Now, Now, did Mary deserve any of this? No, that's right. No. Why does Mary deserve to have the son? She doesn't. Because it's not about Mary, is it? It's about God. Did you, did you notice how many references there were to Mary in this promise? Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and we will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob. And of his kingdom there will be no end. What's the reference to Mary? You're going to have a child. Everything else is about Jesus. This is my son. This is what I'm making him like. This is his kingdom. He's going to be stunning. He's going to be beautiful. He's going to be just like his dad. You know, when Jesus came forth, I can only imagine people would have looked at him and said, he looks nothing like his father. 
or how wrong they were. They didn't know. He was everything like his father. You see, Jesus is a, is a gracious gift for a graceless world, isn't he? We're a graceless world without hope, worthy of nothing. And God gives us an infinitely gracious gift. But, but I think we can, we can sympathize with Mary, can't we, in verse 34 when she says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? It's a fair question. Um, basic biology, even though they didn't have biology classes back then, basic biology meant it's impossible. And yet God gives a, a gracious guarantee a gracious guarantee to Mary. Mary is awestruck and, and lost and probably still terrified and confused and has, has no idea how this could be possible and nothing to pin her hope upon. And so the angel for God says that the Holy Spirit is going to come and overshadow her. This is, this is the first of two great guarantees. Have a look with me. Verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. How could this be, Mary says. And it's as if the angel just says, God. God. It's literally that simple. God. The angel, I could imagine for the angel who, who dwells in the presence of God, Gabriel, it probably seems like a pretty weird question. How could this happen? It's like, you clearly have not seen the one whom I stand before. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, will come and overshadow you. Now, there's two ways of thinking about overshadowing. It's, there's a scary overshadowing. You know um, what it's like when you're small and someone picks on you? Your big brother comes and picks on you. And, and, and all of a sudden, the, the, the sunlight disappears and you realize he's standing behind you. You know, that's the like scary type of overshadowing. That's not what is meant here. There's an overshadowing, which is like a, like a protection. When, when the sun is bearing down upon you, think about it this way. The sun is bearing down upon you in the middle of the day. I can remember this so vividly on the farm. D digging post holes and it's one o'clock in the afternoon and the sun is beating down upon you and all of a sudden out of nowhere comes a cloud and you feel the shade from the cloud and it's just like oh just a blessed reprieve a blessed protection a blessed safety and all of a sudden you feel revitalized again and it's this type of an imagery of the Holy Spirit coming in and overshadowing this child in the womb, overshadowing the entire process to ensure that this child would be born and conceived. There's nothing to do with how the baby is made. So people, oh, this is some weird, like, mythical God and human interaction. No, it's not. The baby is conceived and there, there is this beautiful Holy Spirit guarding Jesus Christ. Do you know what it means to be guarded? Even Jesus knows what it means to be guarded and protected by the Holy Spirit. If he needed it, how much more do we need it? Here is our gracious God guaranteeing the birth of his son and ensuring that he is holy, ensuring that he is perfect. Your salvation requires that Jesus is holy. And to ensure that Jesus is holy, the Holy Spirit does the work needed in the womb of Mary. But then notice there's a second guarantee, and that's a much more physical guarantee, isn't it? It's Elizabeth. And by the way, in case you doubt Mary, you know your barren family member, Elizabeth? She's pregnant. Six months pregnant. She's old as the hills. Literally old as the hills. Some of you older ladies, imagine how you would feel right now if you fell pregnant. Scary, yeah? 
I mean, you know, you hit that point where you're like, yeah, no longer do I want children anymore. She's way beyond that. Elizabeth's pregnant. Mary, there's nothing too hard for God. And, and, and I can't help but wonder if Mary had, had the words sort of jogging in her mind from, from Abraham and Sarah. Do you remember the, the angel turns up to Abraham and Sarah and he says, I'm going to come back next year. God says, I'm going to come back next year and you're going to be pregnant. And Mary's sort of chuckling quietly in the tent. She's like, oh, that'll never happen. Sorry, yes, sir. And it's the same, it's the same story, isn't it? Elizabeth is pregnant just like Sarah was. Because God can do anything. And he can ensure by his gracious power that this child will be what he says You need not doubt, Mary, because God's grace is at work. God's grace is at work, and it doesn't rest on your power. Whose whose power does it rest on? God's, God's, God's. Same thing, same thing that we saw before. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The child to be called will be called holy. It's God that's doing it. See, this is why we can have confidence in our salvation. This is why we can have hope, as I prayed earlier, for our elderly parents. This is why we can have hope that if they've believed in Jesus, they will be saved. Even when their mind's completely gone and they cannot comprehend what any of it means any longer. Because God is the one who saves by His grace. And I guess the only question then is how do we respond? Well, we respond the same way Mary did. By faith. Isn't it profound? Mary said, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I'm, I'm, Lord, I'm your slave. That's what the word means. It's not very politically correct, so it doesn't tend to get used, but it means I'm your slave. I'll do whatever you say. Isn't that not an immense level of trust? And faith. Do you realize this is potentially a death penalty for her? Adultery carries the death penalty. And she knows that. No one's going to believe her. Do you think anyone's going to believe her when she turns out pregnant? And she says, oh, no, it was God. No one believes that story. But she says, Lord, I'll trust you. I'll believe your word. If you say it, I'll trust it. I'll believe it. I've got faith in it. Why? Because grace always leads to faith. Remember Ephesians 2, we're saved by God's grace through faith. Not works, so that no one may boast. Mary's just a 14, 15 year old girl. who's been favored by God. Have you been favored by God? Amen. Have you been favored by God? I hope so. God favors sinners. He sets his love upon them. And they have but one thing to do. Respond by faith. And say, I will believe your word. May it be to me according to your word. And you know, that, that's what this is all about. That's what the Lord's Supper is all about. It's sinners coming and saying, I believe your word. God, you promised that you would pour out your blood 
You promised that you would break your body. Jesus, you promised to die so that I might go free. And so we come and we eat and we drink and we proclaim that again. And we meet with Jesus Christ again. And we remember again. This is like a, a symbol of remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done. And by faith, we take hold of it and eat it and drink it. And remember that just like Mary, there is salvation for you and me. What a glorious Savior we have, filled with grace and truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace. It is infinite. It is never ending. It is high, high as the mountains. Lord, may we never lose sight of its brilliance. Thank you for Jesus Christ who came, who was born. Thank you for your truth declared to Mary. Turn our face towards you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.